Welcome back, Bulls Nation, to another episode of the Nothing But Bull Podcast. I'm your host, Derek, and as always, I'm here with my main man, Justin. Just B, what's going on? Nothing much. I'm cool. Um, I don't know about Melissa. It looks like it's kind of hot where she is. <laughs> She's feeling the heat. You all right, Melissa? <laughs> Are you muted? <laughs> Hey guys, I have no idea what Justin's talking about, but <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not hot where I'm at. I'm in Chicago. It's definitely cold outside. Uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to be back <laughs> in this cold weather. <laughs> of course, we have Melissa, who is featured in the new Jordan brand ad for their women's collective class of 2023. How was that experience, Melissa? Oh, it was cool. It was really fun. Um, <clears throat> The word is official now. We went to, they sent us to Salt Lake City for All-Star Weekend. Um, We went on a retreat. Uh, it was really nice. We got to hang out with some like guest speakers, some very empowering women. Um, they just they just poured into us and then we had a photo shoot which is really cool so those photos just dropped a couple of days ago but um, it was really it was just really nice it, the whole retreat was just them pouring into us and empowering us and um, we were just collaborating on what's to come for the year so big big blessing really excited for what's to come this year so be on the lookout <laughs> um, we did our I, I got to do my first activation. So um, all of the girls had an activation to do for Women's History Month. So for this one, I got to partner up with two of my girls. There's four of us total in Chicago. Um, we have Chelsea, Ayana, and Astro. So I, ch I partnered with Ayana, aka Yaya, and Astro for this one. We did a uh, youth clinic for, um, it was 12 girls. It was really cool. Shout out to Tim because he did an intro for the girls, Tim Seclair of the Bulls, the PA announcer. I'm sure everybody knows, but um, that was really nice. We had it tailored for the girls, a very personable intro. So cool. They were so excited. Um, they played basketball, of course. Um, we had them do an affirmation station, which was really cool. We got them planters, um, basketball planters with the affirmation station was just kind of the same thing that we experienced at the retreat passed it on to them, got to do their affirmations, got to pour into them, had them speaking really great things about themselves um, into their mirrors. And, you know, the metaphor with the planter and them, you have to water yourself every day for the plant to be great, just like these girls have to. You have to be very mindful of how you speak to yourself. Um, <clears throat> we had them, Yaya did a hair braiding station which is really they got to feel really great they got their hair done they all look so cute they were so excited and astro she's a very popular nail artist so astro did um did their nails they, they were just really it was really great to watch them just glow up they were all so thrilled and of course seeing them play basketball seeing them in their element it was just beautiful to watch then we had guest guest speakers too we had um a former chicago sky player who has all of the Olympic medals. Um, Lene Harper, she's so dope. She was very inspiring. And Shanae Crow, Shani Crow, my bad. Shani Crow, she is a just a multifaceted artist. She's amazing. She got to speak to the girls too. Um, she got to speak to the girls. Uh, they both were very inspiring. So um, all in all, we got really great feedback. The girls left feeling really great about themselves and just a really great experience. So that's how that went. That's cool. Did you all have like any um, like similar stories with how you all were approached to appear in the ad and just come together? Um, I think most of us just they just found us on social media mostly and um, some some were referred, I think, and some were found on social media. So they just reached out to us all the same, either via DM or email and 
just spoke to us about the, what the program would be like and if we would be interested. And we went from there. It was last year, I think there were, don't quote me on this, but I think there were 33 girls last year. So this year it was 11. There's Missy. OMG. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Was there like a specific um, moment that that you were like the most excited about or like um, the proudest moment that you had while you were there? In Salt Lake, um, we did a clinic. They put us in charge of a clinic too in Salt Lake. Um, that was probably it for me too. It's It was pretty similar. We did something similar actually. <clears throat> it was also, we also did affirmations with them, got to see them play basketball uh, Isabel Harrison was there too. So she it was really her clinic, her basketball clinic, Isabel Harrison of the sky as of this year, shout out her. So we got to spend some time with these girls. They got to do some drills as well. See, so very similar concept, just being able to reach these girls on a different level. Cause I know growing up for myself, I didn't really have, I know that none of us really had that many types of resources that were really pouring into us, especially as girls in sports. <clears throat> I didn't have anything to look up to in that realm. I mean, I had all of our, I had everybody in the NBA, of course, but you know, that we didn't really grow up on the WNBA, like in that capacity. So for me, that was really important. Um, having a program for mentors to really pour into you as young girls, that that's different for me. <clears throat> so it was nice to be able to be a part of that. And I think that's super important. Like I didn't learn a lot of these like self-love things and like affirmations and all that kind of stuff until I was much older. It was a very, myself, I was, I was very shy. I was very to myself. I put a lot of pressure on myself of a very, un, at a very young age um, to perform. And that's no fault to anybody, but um, I think things like this at a young age make a big difference in in how you're going to be formed as a human. Um, I have very specific memories of certain coaches and of course family and teachers that that did play a major role in shaping your um, shaping your identity, shaping what you want to be and knowing what your limits are, if you do think you're limitless or not. And I think again, these programs are like are super important and um to me, that's just very impactful. Anything involving the youth, anything pouring into the youth, they get so, they have so much pressure from like every angle, especially in the day, this day and age of social media and stuff like that too. They're just constantly looking at things and comparing themselves to other people. And it's hard for them to really come into their own on their own. So that's what I'm most proud about for sure. That's anything nice. Involving the youth. <laughs> Same. Good deal. But it, it, your most exciting moment wasn't the spiritual bonding with the horse. <laughs> I'm very proud that I didn't pass out <laughs> because uh, I'm sure no, why would anybody know this? But I I had an experience with horses when I was a, a wee one. I was a tot and I, I am deathly allergic to horses. I never tried to be around a horse since then, but um, when I was a kid, I went, I tried to do this horseback riding thing and uh wasn't good for me. <laughs> My eyes like blew up like that Martin, that Martin episode. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I hope you guys got that reference, but um, I decided to try it again. They gave us some choices. So it was either spiritual bonding with horses, um, gosh, horseback riding or self making and I chose I actually chose horseback riding but then um it was like a first and second option so the second option was spiritual bonding with the horses and actually it was actually pretty cool I'm not gonna lie and uh, I am proud that I didn't die that's what I'm most, <laughs> I'm most proud of that <laughs> but like, did, you, did you take some Benadryl before you went I just did it I did it so I, I was like man if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go out I want to go out with a bang I want to make sure I remember this experience before anything. I don't want to be drowsy. Well, how did you? How did you know you wouldn't have an allergic reaction? I did it. That's a, uh, you know, this big old risk taker here. I didn't tell. I didn't even tell anybody. I told my parents before I left, and they had like, 
an aneurysm, the both of them like, what are you doing? You need to make sure that they know. And I'm like, I'll be fine. So I made sure that I tried to keep as far away as possible from the horse, but um, there are photos that were out. <laughs> I wasn't as far as I thought I was. <laughs> you were definitely and, not far at all. <laughs> I went in Rome, right? So then I had to make sure to, I took a shower right after, like they had a little, um, they had like some showers there and I, I had to just run and go take a shower right after to make sure I was still existing after that. <laughs> so... <laughs> horses are very spiritual animals that is like no cap like they really are spiritual animals so that was actually really cool they they um they imitate and adjust to your energy not even playing like they went around in a circle and they kind of just mimic how you're feeling the horse like put its head on my shoulder his the horse's name was spirit spirit was like all up in my grill like <laughs> but uh it was cool. It was a really good experience. I, uh, I 10 out of 10 would recommend if you ever have an option to spiritually bond with a horse. <laughs> I recommend. Spiritually bond with a horse. I, you know, I took Keisha horseback riding on um, one of our anniversaries and I'm definitely afraid of horses. And I get on there and the person hands Keisha her horse. The horse's name was Lucky. So, of course, my horse's name was Rebel. Um, but fortunately enough, it was a very cool moment. We did get a chance to like, it, like it was very peaceful, you know, with riding on them and just being around them in general. And I, I just recently uh, learned that uh, they actually have like therapies involving horses. So that's a very cool and unique experience that you had. Um, but with putting on such an event, I'd imagine there's gotta be a lot of challenges that present themselves. Um, when you're trying to collaborate with other people, uh, was there anything in particular when you, when all was said and done that you learned about yourself that you didn't know beforehand? Um, <clears throat> well, working with that, the team, the two girls that was back here at home, uh, that was great. It was amazing. Actually, I think we actually worked really great together as a team. We all have different skill sets. Um, we all come to the table with very, very different very different things, um, different interests. So I think we worked together really great actually. And I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty impressed with myself. <laughs> if if it's learning anything, I was, I didn't think that I could do, I would have never imagined that I could do what transpired. Um, so yes, I do think could things have been better? Of course, all, things could have always been better, but um, we could have worked on timing on one of the one of the exercises a little bit better. But uh, honestly, I I am pretty happy with how everything turned out. I didn't think I didn't think I could do what I could do with the help of these girls. So I overall was pretty pleased. Just like you didn't think you could do this podcast, but we broke you in. <laughs> Thanks. I have food poisoning. Some encouragement from Stacy. <laughs> Game five. <laughs> Ninety-seven finals. Food poisoning. So you know what you ate? Know. That. Do you remember what you ate that caused this to pop I up? Had, I had a quinoa salad. Go figure. <laughs> That's what I get for trying to eat healthy. Yeah. That healthy stuff will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> should have had a steak nobody gets sick eating steak i should have had a burger i should have had nachos i could have had tacos but no i chose a quinoa salad the horse didn't take me out it was the, it was the quinoa salad <laughs> and i'm here to tell about it <laughs> i'm glad you're still here <laughs> thank you <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I guess moving on to the Bulls, who blew out the Hornets last night, uh, won by 30 points. We actually got to see Marco Simonovich play, Dave Terry played, Terry Taylor and Carly Jones was thrown out there too. <laughs> like, that's never happened like this whole season. 
<laughs> so just seeing the young guys go out there and actually get to play Carly scoreless again. <laughs> but shout out Carly. I, I, isn't he like the top? Isn't he the top scorer in the G League though? He's the top scorer in the G League. But as I've said before, <laughs> it's the G League. <laughs> he has not proven me wrong at the NBA level yet. <laughs> so come on, Derek. Give that man his flowers. Come on, man. <laughs> he has not scored <laughs> in either of the two. <laughs> Carly, if you'd like to clap back, please come on the podcast. <laughs> You are more than welcome <laughs> to tell me how you can get a bucket, but until you do get a bucket in a NBA game, I'm going to continue <laughs> calling you out for not being able to score. And he only took one shot, I think, but still. <laughs> All right, but like seriously, like has has Carleek like played the equivalent of even a quarter of basketball in the NBA? <laughs> I don't even know how 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 much has he actually played. Less than I don't know. Than, I want to say he probably, he played like, a, a at least minutes. a quarter that first time where he took four shots and didn't make anything and went to the foul line and misspoke. <laughs> so <laughs> I understand the G Lee. He he was their top scorer, but until he proves me wrong at the NBA level, <laughs> I'm going to keep calling you out, Carly. Derek, that man come on the show. 28 minutes. 28, 28 minutes. minutes. That's, what do you want from him? 28 minutes. To make a shot. <laughs> That's what I want I from guess I set myself up for that one. Make one shot. Yeah. Are you looking at his stats right now, Jess? Yeah. Does he have, like, what kind of stats does he have? Does he have anything like assists, eat, rebounds, anything? Uh, let me see here. Dang. He has half an assist, no half block, an assist? no steal. He has 0.5 defensive rebounds. I'm just talking about getting at his average. But like in games, I'd have to go to the actual games that he's been in. Let me see here. You can't call that man out for that. Yes, I can. And I did it. <laughs> 28 minutes. Oh, Carly, come defend yourself, man. <laughs> Clipping this. Clipping this and posting it on Twitter. Oh, man. <laughs> Terrible, Derek. Justin hey, is still is, searching. <laughs> that is impressive, though, for the G League. Come on. For the yeah, G League. He's a G great League. G League player. I <laughs> My criticism was NBA level. I think he's going to get picked up next year. I think he'll make some money on another team. Like, seriously. Like, because when you think about, there is, like, looking at just, like, with Pat's situation. Pat, who has, like, the physical tools to do whatever he needs to do on that basketball court, has taken a back seat to players on this team for whatever reason. So, when you're talking about, like, coming in there and – you know, trying to make some kind of a name for yourself or trying to, like, just incorporate your style of play into the game is not necessarily an easy, easy thing to do, especially when you have so many other guys, you know, who are ahead of you. And you don't know when you're going to be, you know, allowed to play in the game. You don't know when you're going to be sent back down to the G League. So we'll, we'll, we'll give him a pass. He was nah, saying... He was converted into a full NBA contract. I'm not giving him a pass. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> He's not yeah. a G League player anymore. He's on the actual team. Uh, I can't with you on this, Derek. I just can't. <laughs> I don't know if he'll be on the actual team next game. <laughs> Because the new CBA agreement, the the two way player, we you can get you're allowed two two way players, and now I think next year it starts at you're allowed three. So 
I'm not sure he'll get an actual NBA contract next year, but he may be back as a two-way player. And then he can tear up the G League again. Body blow, <laughs> body blow, body blow. I mean, yeah. when we watched him in Summer League, I, I don't know about you, Justin, but me and Melissa were like, who is this guy? He He's terrible. <laughs> It's like if we had an actual point guard <laughs> in summer league, we would have done better. So for him to okay. go on and lead the G League in scoring, that 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 is a big accomplishment. Shout out to him for that. But at NBA level, I stand by what I said. In the summer league, just about everybody on the Bulls roster in the summer league looked terrible. Um, and even like on during like the Windy City game, like those first couple of games were brutal. Like I started to question everybody who was on that team. Um I don't want to say like I necessarily like questioned like Dalen because I knew what he was capable of. But I did have like some moments where I was like, hmm. but yeah, I mean, give a lot of credit to him for like turning his game around because like it's a far cry from what we saw at the very beginning of the summer. And you know, for for guys, it just takes – it can take players a little bit of time. Um, we saw – and I just want like, just transitioning to Kobe. We saw earlier on some very, very good games from him in his young career. And as things were progressing, it got to that point where a lot of us were like, how much can we get for Kobe right now? Like, <laughs> you know any draft picks or whatever. So like everything, like, like what Stacy was pointing out with Adam, like you don't necessarily want to give up on young talent so easily. Um, So that's all my point with Carly. Like I just only, it's only been with the team for like less than a year. So I'm not going to like clown him or anything like that. So. No, I think I he's definitely. I think he's definitely got room to improve for sure. I mean, that's yeah, that's an impressive stat, even if it's for the G League. I think once he'll have more playing time with a team, <coughs> he'll he'll definitely develop. But <laughs> Derek said, if he gets time with a team, <laughs> savage. Look at Marco. We've had him for three years. He was great in summer league. He used to look great like the whole season with Windy City. Throw him out there last night and he hike, he did nothing. <laughs> like nothing. He was just out there getting cardio. <laughs> He's not an NBA level player. <laughs> I think Marco is a little bit different. Like, you know, I Marco is like a, is an energy player. And I'm glad he was able to get out there and like just run around. <laughs> you know, just let that's out. all he did. <laughs> just let that's, out that's energy. You, you like, just proving Derek's point. About, that's well, all he did. Yeah, I think he said one good screen. <laughs> I'm saying like, just let me finish. Like, because like I looked at Marco, <laughs> and when I was looking at the game, I felt like Marco was that kid in school that was just waiting for recess. You know, to, so he could get some energy out of his system and just run around. You don't know what he's doing. He's just like so happy to be outside. He's just running around. I don't know if Marco necessarily has a skill set that can work in the NBA, but from what we've seen with Carly, shooting is a skill. Like the, he can shoot. Um, for for like I know we haven't seen it yet on the NBA court, but from what we were seeing in the in the G League, uh, we we do see that he can knock down shots, and like if you find somebody like that, you're it's worth it if they're in your system, and you don't have to look outside for more shooting help. It is worth it to kind of explore and try to use your coaching staff to try to upbuild this guy who has put in a ton of work from where he was in the summer to what he was doing in the G League. That's why I'll say like I'm not ready to just say. Carleek, you know, you're you're trash, you don't know how to play. Like he he showed us a skill set that is something that could transfer over into the NBA. That's all I'm saying. So I'm, no, I'm not showed us that. 
You know who else showed us that and won MVP in the G League? Antonio Blakely. Where is he now? <laughs> I thought you were going to bring he, up Dutch. He could score. Yeah, but Blakely is actually doing well overseas. Like a lot of <laughs> overseas, like, not yeah, NBA we, level. We go over this kind of stuff, and like people, people just like want to gloss over the importance of having coaches who are going to develop players. Like a lot of people, I'll give you a perfect example: Malik Monk. When Malik Monk came into the league, there was a lot of people who were like, "Why? Why are you taking this kid? Like, why are you taking him?" And like, uh, I think it was for the, for Charlotte. Like, what this kid? Yeah, you know, he can't do whatever. He was a teammate of Antonio Blakeney's when they were at LSU. A lot of people were out on Malik Monk. You go years and years and years, and what is he doing with the Sacramento Kings right now? He's like a pivotal piece of them moving forward. The same thing with campaign. And I'm not saying like, oh, like we should have like kept campaign or we even should have kept Antonio Blakeney. What I am saying is that when you do have certain players who do have a skill set that necessarily works in today's NBA, you should not be so, you know, willing to just discard them, cultivate them, build them up. Teaching is important as an NBA head coach. And we see it from a lot of coaches around the league especially what's happening in New York with Tom Thibodeau. Teaching is important. So that's why I'm saying, like, when you have these young guys and they don't necessarily work out initially, you got to be careful about saying, like, oh, this person is this. They're not going to turn into whatever. So that's all That's all I'm going to say on this soapbox. I challenge Carly to prove me wrong. And like I said, <laughs> hasn't happened yet. You want to come on and defend yourself? You're more than welcome to join the podcast. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to continue to call him out until he scores a basket in the NBA. <laughs> Talk about Blakely's uh, doing good in overseas. Hassan Whiteside looks like Shaq in his prime over in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I don't hear about overseas. <laughs> this dude had like 53 points of like 30-some rebounds over in Puerto Rico. He's not doing that in the NBA. He's out of the NBA. Because nobody valued him after like his first good season, and then he just dropped off. If you're not but, NBA yeah. level talent, you're not <laughs> NBA level talent. Coaching, okay, definitely little little matters. development definitely matters, and you also have to fit in the system of whatever team you're you're going to be in. But yes, coaching definitely matters. But at what point do you have to take initiative for yourself and just work on your craft and just do what you have to do? Because we talked a lot differently about Kobe this year in the very beginning of the season. I was on the, I, I was very indifferent about him. Not going to lie in the very, in the, in the beginning of the season, after a few games, I'm like, you know, I would like to keep him, but honestly, if we let go of him, I wouldn't be upset. I would like to see him develop, but whatever happens happens. But now, like now, no, towards the end of the season, man, Kobe's been a, a very valuable piece for us. He has really developed his game and if we're having the same conversation about like the coaching staff, um, it's the same coach from the beginning of the season since last year up until now. At what point are you going to take your initiative as a professional player to up your game? So yes, coaching definitely matters, but at the same time, you're a professional. Like this is what you've been training for your whole life. This is, in most cases, this is a dream for people that are in the NBA. Like you got to work at it, you know? Of course, it'll. Yeah, no. Great coach, but I, I definitely understand that. You're like, you do have to put in the work, but a lot of times, what gets overlooked, like, because I don't know if people like people who look at these games and look at these coaches. I don't know if a lot of, a lot of people have experience actually having trained somebody. There's a lot of people who do different things, professions, arts, whatever, who come in and they are very talented. But what they lack is an understanding of the type of commitment and the type of the type of sacrifice that you have to do to step out of your comfort zone. If there has not been somebody who necessarily gives you the guidance and tells you, no, look, this is what you need to specifically do to grow as a player. You can find yourself like casting a player to the side and totally like stopping the potential for their growth that could have manifested itself if 
that coach or that trainer or somebody had taken it upon themselves to explicitly tell them, this is how you need to work in order to maximize yourself as a player. You can be one of the most gifted athletes that you want to, but if no one, if you don't have that understanding of where you need to get to, then all is going to be lost. You're never going to realize what you can become. And I'm glad you mentioned that thing with Hassan Whiteside, uh, Derek, because Hassan Whiteside had a lot of different traits, even coming out of college. But I remember when he played with, with the Heat and they were talking about his background. The coaches who coached him in college were like, yeah, he has this background. He has this amount of talent. But with Hassan Whiteside, it was a matter of work ethic. Work ethic is the NBA and doing what he is capable of doing. With some of these other young players, though, it's not necessarily a matter of work ethic. If you are going down the wrong path and there's nobody who's providing that guidance for you, then you can really stout a player, especially a young player's growth in the league. That's all I'm saying. I feel you. I understand. But at the same time, you got to have a winner's mentality. Score a bucket, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I, I'm not – both things can be true. I do think that he will develop <clears throat> a better player when given more opportunity. But at the same time, I also don't – I don't believe – I don't buy into just giving people excuses either because the coaching staff isn't doing what they're supposed to do at this level. So I think, I mean, two things can be true. I do believe that he, I don't think he's trash. I don't think he's garbage. <laughs> um, I do think he will get better, but but I also don't want to blame it on the coaching staff either. Would it help? Of course it would help to be developed in a certain way, but I do think that a professional at any level that wants to compete has to take it into their own hands, just like Kobe did, just like Kobe asked for the tapes because he knew he wanted to improve on his defense. He knew he wanted to improve on hand, his handles. And he actively sought out tapes to improve those things. He did that on his own will and accord. And he did that for himself. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> we talked a lot. No, about I get you. I get you. And I, I definitely see both sides of it. But like I was telling somebody before, like, okay, we live in like the AAU culture. A lot of those team, those guys are not getting the type of coaching that they need to have. We also live in the one and done culture. A lot of those guys like practices in college are more limited. Access to players are more limited. So even if you necessarily have a good coach, are you getting that preparation that you need to be successful at this particular level? Because at this level, a lot of people are putting in the work. A lot of people have had good coaching, you know, throughout their careers. But that's why I guess it's just from like my background as a teacher and seeing and being around you know, teachers who have no business being anywhere close to students to shape their their thinking, as opposed to being around some of the most excellent, well qualified teachers that you want to come across. If you don't have that right person in place to lead your team, particularly your young, um, your young you know, talent that's on your roster, you can be setting yourself back. And I say this to mention that even with Dale and Terry, I'm excited about Dale and Terry because every single time that he is on the court, he just makes some type of winning play, you know, something where you can like hang your hat on and like, oh, that's an advanced move. But like Dale was taken like what, 18th in last year's draft? There's like 11 other players who were drafted ahead of him that have been able to carve out significant roles on their team and has helped their team win on their, their respective team. So like when you don't have that person who is guiding the player and nurturing them and everything, it can really, really um, make that player take a step back. Dalen almost caught a body last night. <laughs> If that dunk would have went down, that would have been one of the highlights of the year. Dalen doesn't need <coughs> – he all he needs is Billy to put him out there. 
that's all he needs because Damar has done all the other stuff with Dalen because Billy Billy's not developing anybody. So just just give Dalen time. Harleek. <laughs> Let let him go back to the G League, man. He's leading Dead. scorer. Like <laughs> I'm going to keep messing with Carly. <laughs> you you like want that Kobe. man to overcome overcome eight eight guards that we have on this team. <laughs> Be like Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I agree with Melissa. Like beginning of the year, you're like, can we get anything for Kobe? <laughs> now you're like we got to resign him. And the Bulls front office has decisions to make because are you you got to resign Kobe, but what are you going to do with Io? And honestly, right now, I'd resign Kobe over Io. Yeah. Is it a sophomore slump? Or do you think <laughs> just what do you guys think? This is more like he hit the rookie wall and went straight into the slump because he's been all downhill since last year. You can attribute it to that. I mean, I don't know. It took me just a, maybe like a two weeks to realize, hey, yeah, Io, he's not a point guard. Like we, we need to like get him going downhill. Maybe like you put him in some pick and roll actions with Booch. Um, but Kobe, like, I think Kobe scored, like, 11 points last night. And I was looking at uh, Will Gottlieb, who I follow on Twitter. He was, like, just listing, like, the assists that Kobe had his last five games. It was 9, 9, 5, 6, and 9. That's an incredible amount of assists, considering that Kobe is coming off the bench and still playing less minutes than I feel like he should be playing. But, like, that... That game last night with Kobe was just the highlight reel of everything that I like about what Kobe is doing this year, uh, particularly recently. But we talked about this back in January. We had Kobe in the ball pit, you know, and we were talking about, like, you just might as well just start Kobe. But I love the fact of, like, he is recognizing, just like I think it's obvious, that when him – um, Pat and Levine are in the game. Can't double team all of us. And he's using like just sound basketball IQ to find the open man, like just making tremendous decisions with that. In the pick and roll game, he's got gotten better at like recognizing with getting uh, defenders to get on his hip. And he's, you know, he, we talked about this before where he's shooting a high percentage enough finishing at the rim so and defenders know that as well so it's like you got to pick your poison am i going to stop kobe with his quickness coming off of that screen and stopping him from finishing at the rim or am i going to stop booch and there was like two or three passes that were just dime passes to booch in the post allow booch to finish right in the paint easy buckets and then another thing defensively that i liked about kobe was he couldn't make it there was like one of the players, I forget who was lighting us up like in that game. So there was like one, it was book night, I think. But he kept getting caught on the screen. And instead of him trying to fight through the screen, which he wasn't successful in, he just kept going underneath and underneath and underneath. And the guy tried screening him like three times on in within one possession. And it eventually led to um, it was the book night or one of the other players taking a contested two. Teams don't want to shoot contested twos. They prefer to be able to shoot the threes, but because of the positioning that he had with his defender, he could have easily just gotten out and contested the shot. There's a lot of smarts that are going on with Kobe's uh, game understanding from the offensive and defensive side of the ball. And I really don't think that the Bulls, not having Lonzo Ball to look into the future to count on, I don't think the Bulls can afford to lose it. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I, I I could easily see him being the starting point guard of, at the start of next year, unless you know they they want to keep Pat and Billy just decides that he'd rather have a veteran point guard run the team. 
which is a Billy decision. <laughs> but yeah, I, Kobe is brewed. Like, if you put him out there with Zach and P. Will, and pretty much anybody you put Kobe out there with, he's making good things happen. He's increased yeah, his game, which I think he's all, he's always had that confidence, and it was kind of blind confidence last year in the beginning of this season, but now he has the skill set to match. So, yeah, I, I can see that happening too, him being starting point next year. It's been great to yeah, see him develop. He, he unlocked so much stuff for this Bulls offense that makes Billy's way of calling the game, the offensive sets, work. And as much as people like lament Pat not grabbing enough rebounds or, you know, Pat not going aggressively to the basket, well, one of the things that Kobe being out there does it is it opens up extra shot attempts, wide open shot attempts for Pat. And no matter what people might want to say about Pat defensively or rebound like I mean defensively he's been pretty solid even though he's been missing out on certain rotation and not understanding when he has to blitz um, the player or when he needs to sag off but the thing is is that they with Kobe out there you're actually able to hone in on something that Pat has been excellent at throughout the year his three-point shooting and we we want them to shoot three-pointers but we want the right people to be shooting the three pointers, not Derek Jones Jr. or, you know, Io shooting those three pointers. But when Kobe's coming off the screen, you got to account for Kobe, you got to account for Levine, you got to account for Pat. We get those guys in catch and shoot situations. It's going to be lights out for this team, as long as the coaching staff recognizes it. I do not mind Dirk Jones Jr. taking corner threes because more times than not, he makes them. I cannot say the same for Io. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, you're wide open in the corner. <laughs> He'll knock them down here and there, but for the most part, you kind of know that Io's going to brick that shot. Uh, I'd I'd much rather Dirk Jones Jr. take it than Io. Yeah, I think with what goes on with this team and the way, excuse me, the way like Donovan like chooses his matchups, and I'm not trying to like get on Donovan because I know like we've had that show already. Um, but Every show he did. <laughs> well, he keeps giving us like, you know, ammunition for the show. So I understand like, like going the Clipper there game. Sometimes. <laughs> The way he calls games, it stretches this team thin. Like, when you think about it, Caruso and Beverly are both pretty much the same player. And I say that in the sense of if you look at their stats, you know, they're both averaging like six points a game, three rebounds a game, and like maybe three assists per game. To ask them to win their matchups on the defensive side and also be responsible for effectively helping shape the offensive identity of this team is a tall order. And I don't know how long you can like get away with it because there's, there's just going to be some matchups that Caruso is not going to be able to win just from like a pure physical standpoint. You're just not going to be able to win. You can't have him guarding power forwards and or like small forwards who have a solid mid-range game that outweigh him like 30, 40 pounds. Like I understand like we have faith in Caruso's ability and even Pat's ability um, to be a, just a, a pest, someone that you hate playing against on, on that, that side of the ball. But like, and I understand the Pat Beverly effect. Like, we are all buying into that. But it's just not something that I see as being feasible moving forward. Like, there's no way. Like, Caruso is, like, effective when you can administer him in smaller doses. But asking him to hold up throughout the course of the game, I don't see how that works. 
Well, he always get it's injured. He's yes, guarding bigger people. Uh, he's he's diving on the floor. He's taking charges. He's <laughs> he's getting banged up, like on pretty much a lot of plays each game, which is why he's, he's in and out of the lineup with injuries sometimes. Like the the foot sprain, they say he'll be dealing with it the rest of the season. He's questionable for tomorrow's mm-hmm. game. Um, Javante's questionable for tomorrow's game as well. Drummond is no longer on the injury report. Um, so I guess his his mental state has improved, which is good because we missed him in the in that game against the Lakers. Like we <laughs> really missed him and his rebounding. But yeah, um this team needs a power forward <laughs> and to not play AC at that position and let him play his natural position and doses off the bench. And I think he'd be a lot more healthy and could play a lot more games that we would need him to come in and guard like a point guard or shooting guard and not a power forward. Well, it's like, the team, like, you you might not need those things if the team played a different style of defense. <clears throat> For instance, like, I don't know. Have you guys ever, like, watched, like, war movies or, like, you've seen Braveheart before? Like, either one of you? I've seen it. Well, like, when the Scots are when they're fighting up against the English army, the English army is like way more powerful than, than they are. There is no way that you can win a head on fight with them, which is why throughout the movie, you watch like these different war movies where like one of the, the, the people, the adversaries is like small in number. They don't attack the same way with this bulls team and them having so many guys that are long, smaller, but long, to me, it would make sense if you were playing more full court, if you were trapping more, because they have guys who can make up ground on defense. We've even seen Andre uh, and his ability to play the passing lanes. That's something that I remember I was going back to when Matt was on the show, and he was like, talking about the fact that, well, Andre is not much of like a rim protector, but we did discuss the fact that he played passing lanes very well. He gets steals. Like, you cannot wait for the bigger opponent to be able to get into their half court set because that's going to create mismatches on a roster where everybody is pretty much undersized. To me, it would make more sense if like the Bulls were attacking them more on defense and you know trying to get turnovers that way, allowing them to just play fast and not have to think about defensive rotations and all of that when they're in the half court set. That is something that I, I would like for them to like look at moving forward because they have the personnel to do it, but they just don't for whatever reason, which is kind of it's just strange. Billy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we're at that point up. So yeah, we're <laughs> we're blaming Billy. Uh like, like <laughs> that Clippers game. Justin is texting like vehemently, like if we had a better coach with better rotations, <laughs> we would not have lost that game. I'm just like, well, that's what I've been saying like the whole year. So, yeah, I'm not alone. <laughs> but are you all generous? Like, it is kind of exciting watching. The Bulls get within a, a one game of the eighth seed. Do you guys think that there's a possibility that they could like overtake Toronto and Atlanta for that eighth seed and just win that like out? I think it's possible. Very small chance. <laughs> we would have to win. All five of these games, we have to win out. I think Atlanta. Well, no, we would beat Atlanta winning out, so that would make us jump automatically. 
I think if Atlanta loses two, we could go four and one. So there's a chance. It's just that are they going to be prepared to come out and play tomorrow on a Sunday, which Philly's teams don't really have a good record on the weekends, against John Morant and the Memphis Grizzlies, who are trying to lock up the second seed in the West but still also have a chance to overtake Denver and get the first seed. What time is that game? It's at 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Chicago time. I, I got to, like, see, like, Pat <laughs> and Dylan going at it. I Like, I, I, I am dying to see the matchup of Dylan and Pat. Give me some trash. Like, they should mic up Pat for that game. You think they'd be able to like? <laughs> no, <laughs> like you don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they'd be able to air that content <laughs> from that day. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's kind of an early <laughs> on a Sunday in Chicago. And it's Benny's birthday. <laughs> Shout out, Benny. Happy birthday, Benny. I thought you said Billy for... I would not know Billy's birthday. <laughs> 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 I would kind of rule that day that he was born. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> so, yeah, Benny, Benny the Bull. <laughs> it's his birthday. <laughs> Shout out to Benny. <laughs> You're not alone, Carly. <laughs> plenty of strays to go around. Oh, they're not strays. <laughs> they're very these, these are locked on sniper shots. Okay. <laughs> Target is locked in targets. <laughs> so, yeah, if we, we want to get that AC. You gotta you gotta come out. You gotta be Memphis. Then you go into Atlanta. Well, no, Atlanta comes to Chicago. So three out of the last five are home games. Memphis comes in tomorrow, Atlanta Tuesday, which is the tiebreaker in that series. Uh we go and play the Bucks in Milwaukee Wednesday. Play Luke and Kyrie on Friday in Dallas. And then we end the season Sunday, April 9th, Easter, in Chicago against the Pistons, who we've beat like what 14 straight times. Yeah, the Pistons aren't playing it for anything. Dallas is a dumpster fire. Milwaukee by that time might be resting their players. Um, depending on because I'm not sure like who is like one and two? Is Milwaukee ahead of Boston for that number one seed? I think last time I checked, they were. Um, currently, yeah, they're number one. Uh, Boston is a game and a half back of that first game seed. And a half. So they might have like the number one seed locked up by that time, depending on how things shape up over the next few days. So we might catch a break with that. Not saying that we can't beat Milwaukee because we have, but might have they might be having less to play for. Yeah, so. Yeah, looking at the schedule for Atlanta, they have the Mavericks, they have us, then they have the Wizards, Philly, and Boston. 
are the Wizards still like in contention with making the plan? Got thirty four wins. That doesn't look like that's gonna happen. No, <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, <laughs> the Raptors schedule. They played Hornets twice. They played ah. Celtics twice, and then they played the Bucks last game of the season. Okay. Damn. Wizards play the Knicks, the Bucks, the Hawks, the Heat, and the Rockets. And that playing tournament might be. Might be our best shot then. Well, either way, it's going to be a playing tournament. But at least if we can get to eight, we only have to win one. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. You got to try to win out. What's the longest winning streak that we've had this year? Three. <laughs> Three. It's <laughs> we can never get that fourth one. Ugh. So who if the Bulls want to go on a well, it'll be a six game winning streak, they're, they're gonna have to win these next five games. Repeat the three P. <laughs> so how how are we feeling about this winning out? <laughs> no, no, nobody wants. To... <laughs> I'm not taking those odds. <laughs> <laughs> not a betting man, but I'm not taking those odds. I am going with us getting the eighth seed and going 4-1 with the Hawks losing two. (laughs) Melissa. (laughs) I gotta go next. I'm gonna go uh, I'm gonna go crazy with this one. (laughs) I'm gonna go. (laughs) I shouldn't say. She's going five and zero. Five and zero. That's what I'm doing. Five and zero. Let's go. I think I'm delusional. <laughs> I think it's the food poisoning. I don't know. <laughs> five and zero. I was just about to say, are you in your right mind right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. go with you, Derek. Four and one. I'll I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, I I think the Hawks they drop at least two because I they dr- they're going to drop to us <laughs> on Tuesday. We get that tiebreaker, and I don't see them beating Philly. I don't see them beating Boston either. Crazier things have happened. Crazier things like <laughs> Dennis Smith Jr.'s wing stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's shout out Stacy for cooking that man for no reason. <laughs> it's on the he's on the bench on the walking boo, just minding his business and this. This green sweatsuit and stays like that a wing stop sweatsuit. <laughs> Nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. Hopefully the you know, we go four one five oh get this eight seed. You guys can celebrate with some wing stop and <laughs> We move from the play into the playoffs by winning one game. Well, we were most likely going to be matched up with 
the Bucks or the Celtics. <laughs> but um, we were called the the most dangerous playing team. So that's right by Bill Simmons, right? I haven't heard that one. Yeah, Bill Simmons said we're the most dangerous playing really? team. Really? Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna believe that, and <laughs> not necessarily a title that we would like to and have, but we, but it's we, the best possible situation. <laughs> we've beaten the good teams this year, so yeah, locking us into a series with good teams and. Pat Bev telling people they're too small and you know Zach and Damar and Kobe play how they've been playing. Side you note, know. I also love how Pat has been working with Io too. I don't know if you I've seen some videos floating around of him working with Io in practice. So another shout out, head nod to Pat Bev. Just Billy keep Io out of the rotation in the playoffs. The limit him please <laughs> but yeah we're we're gonna um more strays <laughs> that one might have been a stray <laughs> it's not a stray it I, <laughs> I hope all he can do is get downhill that that's all he's been doing dang all the smoke so we got marco <laughs> harleek billy and <laughs> hit list wait hey <laughs> Do your job, and I won't talk about you. <laughs> oh, gosh. But, yeah, we're going to hope for the best here with this playing situation and see if the Bulls can make some noise. But until then, go Bulls. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Tennis game.